Now, Xenarchus is interesting as well, because not only being obsessed with mathematics and music, but he was also an architect, um, and he worked with my choice of second um, secret mathematician. Um, here are some plans that he did with this, uh, uh, this other, other architect I'm going to choose. These are plans for a pavilion uh, that was built in Brussels, and you can see they actually share a lot in common with that score uh, for metastasis. Um, but Xenarchus wor worked with my second choice of a secret mathematician who comes from the world of architecture, and uh, I've chosen Le Corbusier. Um, now, of course, architecture, again, is a place where you need a very um, careful balance between the creative world, artistic side, but also the side of engineering and mathematics. You need those buildings to stand up. Um, but Le Corbusier was very interested in tapping into uh, mathematical ideas for his creative um, process. Um, and he actually uh, tapped into a sequence of numbers we've sort of seen already, actually. Um, so he had these, ra these things called the series rouge and the series bleu, which would be a sequence of numbers which the, the buildings had to reflect the, the proportions of these numbers. And if you look at these numbers, um, uh, very quickly you should see that they have the same sort of rules as the Fibonacci numbers, because you get the next one by adding the, first, the previous two together. So it sort of has a little bit of time to settle down, but 0.43 plus 0.7 zero is 1.13. And uh, Le Corbusier believed that these uh, Fibonacci style ratios were actually reflecting ratios inside the body and that a building um, should reflect the ratios of the body. That's actually something which goes back to um, Vitruvius, the Roman architect, that a building should, um, will, will work well when its proportions are those that are the proportions of the human body. Um, and actually, it's, uh, these Fibonacci numbers uh, can be used, this way of growing numbers, to grow structures. So this is why we see it in the natural world and why they were very appealing to an architect like Le Corbusier. For example, if we go back to those Fibonacci numbers and I, I build a building with those um, proportions given by the Fibonacci numbers. So I start with a little one-by-one one room, and then I add another one-by-one one room alongside of that. Uh, now I know about one-by-two, so I add a two-by-two two room onto the side of uh, my first two rooms. And then now I've got now a two-by-three structure, I can add a three-by-three three room. So very naturally, you build up um, this shape uh, which has a natural spiral inside it. Um, and this is why we find this, these sort of spirals are associated with these Fibonacci numbers. And the ratios of this um, rectangle that is beginning to emerge, we started with just a square, but this rectangle, the proportions are tending towards a, a proportion called the golden ratio. Uh, the golden ratio is a ratio that we find all over the artistic world, something that's people seem to be naturally drawn to as aesthetically pleasing. Um, so a, a rectangle is in the golden ratio. If you take the, the ratio of the long side to the short side, that, that should be the same as the ratio of the sum of the two sides to the long side. Um, so a lot of architects have tapped into this since ancient times. So um, the ancient Greeks knew about um, uh, this proportion that they felt it was somehow the perfect proportion. You're, you're meant to be able to find them in things like the Parthenon. Um, and, but interestingly in music as well, uh, um, I did a little bit of work with the Royal Opera House last year on the magic flute and um, exploring uh, the lot of mathematics which runs through the magic flute. Now, Mozart was absolutely obsessed with uh, mathematics, um, and he became a mason very towards the end of his life, and the masons are also obsessed with mathematics. So there's a lot of mathematics hiding inside the score of the magic flute. But what was most exciting for me was to discover that if you look at the overture, the overture starts with a kind of chaotic uh, queen of the night um, kind of uh, music, and then suddenly there's this triple chord that happens, and then you get sort of Sarastro's music coming out, out of there, which is much more ordered. If you look at the proportions of where the triple chord occurs, the, the kind of music of the Queen of the Knights to um, the music of Sarastro, um, it's 83 bars up to the triple chord, and then 130 bars after that. It's the closest numbers that you can get to create the golden ratio. Now, I believe that sometimes people are drawn um, sort of intuitively towards that kind of ratio, but I suspect that Mozart very deliberately put that ratio inside um, the uh, overture to the magic flute because it pre creates a, a moment of um, interesting tension uh, at that particular point um, in a piece of music. Debussy also tapped into the idea of the golden ratio being the right moment to do something dramatic in a piece of music.
So Le Corbusier as well felt that in a building, these um, idea of the golden ratio and these Fibonacci numbers gave you buildings which had um, a natural sense of growth and would be appealing buildings to live inside. Now, it's interesting. This is one of the classic examples of a Le Corbusier building. Now, you might say this looks horrific, but actually, I've talked to people who live inside these buildings, and the way that the um, rooms are laid out, uh, they say, are incredibly pleasing. And this is a, said to be a wonderful building to live inside. Um, now, actually, of course, Le Corbusier wasn't the first architect to explore the idea of um, ratios being very important to the way that you grow a building. And in fact, uh, one of the classic examples, of course, is Palladio. Uh, now, Palladio wasn't interested in Fibonacci style numbers, but actually in whole number ratios. So he liked to build his um, rooms such that all of the rooms um, were in the sort of perfect whole number ratios to each other. And I think this is the reason when you go into a Palladio villa, there seems to be something so perfect about the proportions inside there. And what actually it's tapping into is that those are proportions that we actually find very appealing in the musical world as well. And the the basis of all of them are these whole number ratios. It's mathematics hiding behind there. So for example, if you take a Palladio villa and you put strings on the sides of the rooms, of the lengths of those rooms, and pluck the strings... You get three notes which sound incredibly harmonious together. A one to two ratio of a bill uh, on the sides of the room actually corresponds in music to an octave. Uh, one to two ratio inside the, the, the wavelengths. Um, a two to three relationship, another um, proportion that Palladio loved, is the perfect fifth, the building blocks of the harmonic world of music. And some would say that Palladio's villas are, in some sense, frozen music. Um, And if you compare Le Corbusier and Palladio, who both enjoyed these kind of ratios, one growing out of Fibonacci numbers, one growing out of these whole number ratios, um, here are some of their notebooks. Now, this looks to me like the notebook of a mathematician who's exploring what are all the different ways that you can put these rooms together. Palladio loves symmetry, so all all of his rooms have a lot of symmetry embedded in them. them, them. them. Um, Le Corbusier... uh, He likes to to mess a little bit with symmetry. So you see the way that he lays out his rooms are uh, are more asymmetrical. And actually throughout uh, the 20th century and 21st century, um, you find a lot of um, different architects tapping into mathematical structures. So um, this is actually a Le Corbusier chapel, um, which taps into sort of hyperbolic geometry. Um, If you go to the Guggenheim in Bilbao, then uh, Frank Gehry is using kind of lots of ideas of Riemannian um, manifolds to create this extraordinary effect. And of course, here in London, um, if you go to the Olympic Park and see um, the building uh, built by Zaha Hadid, um, Zaha Hadid is again another architect who loves using her mathematics. In fact, she studied mathematics um, in Iraq before she became um, an architect. Um, so um, if we return, um, actually, you see, I, I, Le Corbusier is somebody who likes to mess a little bit with symmetry. And I always think that the, this thing, modular man, which has these proportions inside them, are a sort of 20th century version of um, uh, Leonardo's uh, Vitruvian man. And, and of course, Vitruvian man actually is um, a solution to an architecture problem. Vitruvius was writing about architecture in Roman times, and, and he said this challenge that um, you should be able to create a building which has the proportions of a circle and a square, and inside those proportions you should be able to lay out perfectly um, uh, the human body um, stretched out with its arms stretched out to make the square. Um, and actually, many artists have tried to create, well, what, how do you put the square and the circle together uh, and fit a human inside there? Um, and a lot of people tried to make it symmetrical and put um, the centre of the square and the centre of the circle together, but that always created a very um, disproportioned uh, person inside. And it was Leonardo's kind of brilliance to, to move the square down such that the, um, the centre of the circle is, is, is centred on the belly button and the, the centre of the square is uh, focused on the genitals, and then it creates this kind of perfect um, figure. 